It's so lovely to be here and really, really exciting to be part of this uh, first annual conference. Um, and we've got lots and lots of synergies with the Association of Collaborative Design, particularly around democratising design, which is a core part of our strategy. So um, Kate's introduced us, so I, I'll just actually kind of skip over that, but just to say that um, I'll be sharing this bit about Design Council um, and some projects as well as UMI and then Tasovic, um, Umi and myself will be in the breakout rooms for further discussion with you. Um, so I was just going to start with a bit about Design Council before moving on to some case studies um, and UMI's work. But for those who don't know, Design Council is the government's advisor on design. We've been around since 1944. This is the very first picture of the Design Council in meeting uh, in 1944. We were set up before the end of the Second World War in order to raise the standards of design so that we could be built part of rebuilding a post-war economy, which kind of on the verge of Brexit and as we come out of uh, the worst of the COVID crisis, well, uh, of, the, of the crisis bit, of the COVID crisis, um, you know, we couldn't be more relevant. Um, but, and we like this picture because there's two women at the table at the beginning who are not the secretaries, which most people think, but they are full members of the council. And actually the secretary who did set it up was a woman and she was allowed to continue being a civil servant um, after she got married, which at the time wasn't allowed at all. So we're proud of that. But we're prouder even now that we're much more diverse and much more digital than that picture showed. Uh, this is us now. We're a charity and our vision is where a world, uh, where a world where design is a force for change makes life better for all. So inclusion is at the heart of what we do. Um, we work across different um, offers, I suppose. We do evidence led research we use that to provide strategic uh, independent advice uh, through which we create design-led programs in communities doing design and through that we can make the case for more policy uh, um, more policy around design so in summary we work from grassroots to government uh, we're really unique in that we work across architecture in the built environment and place shaping uh, public services and social innovation, which Tatovic leads on, and then also business innovation as well. So we cover all of those uh, types of design. Uh, we've got a huge network, so UMI is part of the network, and obviously the Association of Collaborative Design are our friends, um, and we are able to bring people together to convene safe, impartial spaces. Um, and some of you may have heard of the Double Diamond, but that's something we created at Design Council 15 years ago. Um, have been using it ever since and our strategy at the moment is very much about um, uh, three things so sustainable living health and well-being and design skills so making sure design is used for those outcomes and we did some research over the summer and time and time again collaborative design is coming up as just critical to um, make a difference for climate change and also health and well-being these are not technical kind of design problems these are social ones and they require people to be part of it um, and as I said in order to um, meet those strategic objectives we have to set ourselves some design principles one of which at the bottom there is designing democratically so making sure that we're sharing power and design skills with communities um, and building on that design for us is really um, a kind of a skill set absolutely um, but also a mindset. So it's around um, creative problem solving using the head, the heart of being humanity centered, being um, uh, people and planet focused, and also those practical making skills to not just talk about what should happen, but actually make it happen and bring people together around it. And this is a framework for innovation that we use, uh, which, which we've kind of taken the double diamond, but put around it engagement and leadership and that's so important because if you want to design with people you have to spend time engaging and building relationships and also leadership of self but also others and, and sharing the skills so i'm just going to quickly touch on a couple of projects before i hand over to umi but some of the work that we we've, we've been doing over the last year is um projects around co-design and co-production so home of 2030 was a project uh, that we did for the government they wanted to create a competition to design the future home initially they want just wanted to put that out as a competition we said let us do some um, engagement and co-design work so we worked with about 300 people across the country 
um, in workshops to help, well, first of all, to provoke them to think about different alternative scenarios in the future. Uh, we did actually miss out um, COVID. We didn't actually foresee that. So uh, working from home isn't quite in there. But um, we did think about worlds where there was greater urbanization, greater climate change. Um, so we could co-design with people having provoked them to think what the future might look like. And they came up with a whole series of principles, which we then used to um, put out to the competition. Um, and things that surprised us were things like agency, getting the basic rights um, and um, interacting with neighbours were just so important, which is, might be different from what architects might instinctively come up with, which is often the, about the visuals. Uh, Transform Aging was a lo long project we ran in the southwest of England. For those who don't know, it's a very rural area, lots of social isolation among older people. Um, and this was really interesting because it was always supposed to be a project where we'd worked with older people to understand their needs and aspirations, but then put those briefs out to social entrepreneurs. And what we realised through doing all that engagement work is that older people quite rightly said, well, I want to come up with the idea and I want to develop the idea. So we pivoted the project and we made sure that we had funding available for people in later life who wanted to take forward those ideas. And 46% of the ideas then came from people in later life and they generated 193 jobs, 800 volunteering opportunities, um, 3.73 million pounds. Um, and so individually, they were all really lovely services, uh, for example, dementia bathing in forests, but collectively, they really transformed how we thought about employment in later life. Um, this is a similar project, uh, BBC Radio for the Fix is a radio programme I present. Um, it's three years old. This year we did um, a project in Barking and Dagenham, um, where also participatory city is based, a uh, hotbed of innovation. And uh, we took everyone through a design thinking pro process to um, come up with solutions around debt. And again, what's interesting here is the projects we came up with were all produced and delivered and led by people experiencing debt. So I've been there, which is the were kind of the winning project, uh, was a peer led network of people who'd been in debt, providing advice to those who might be coming into debt. And one of the big programs we run at Design Council is something called Design in the Public Sector, very like public practice, but more on the service design side. And we've supported about 100 teams over the last six years to reimagine people centred services. And again, here, the story I wanted to say is, as well as doing kind of human centered design and making sure that services are really easy to access, actually what the teams are starting to move toward is more co-produced services like Spark, which is a service um, in Staffordshire in the middle of the country for um, uh, vulnerable children. And rather than the council providing that service, they, through engaging parents of those vulnerable children, they were able to say, well, why don't you come up with the service and, and deliver it? And that's what Spark is. And it's a really inclusive thing as a result. So I'm going to pass over to Umi now and you can tell me next. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so as mentioned at the beginning, um, as well as my role as a design associate with Design Council, um, I'm also part of the public practice alumni, which essentially means that I've gone through the public practice placement um, program and I'm still part of the network in terms of helping to increase uh, capacity in the public sector. So for anyone who doesn't know um, about public practice, um, uh, they are an emerging social enterprise that improves the quality um, e and equality of everyday places by building the public sector's capacity for proactive planning and regeneration. Um, and they do that with their placement program that essentially puts designers and innovators um, in local authorities that lack these expertise. Um, so to contextualize, I was part of 0.7% of architects working for the public sector. So in 1976, the 49% of all UK registered architects worked for the public sector. So in spite of the fact that we're probably at one of the most um, challenging, challenging moments in recent history in terms of the importance of the built environment, a lot of local authorities don't actually have that in-house capacity. Um, 
So my role there allowed me to co-author a research and development guide and tools to help local government um, move beyond baseline consultation to a more meaningful participatory approach um, that would facilitate co-design and co-production. Uh, next slide, please. So real co-production means that citizens are truly involved in planning and designing services from the very beginning of delivery. Um, co-production is the relationship where professionals and citizens share power to design, plan, access and deliver support together. However, um, many local authorities face many constraints in being able to deliver these. Um, we found that these were most often constraints of time, resources, skills. Nevertheless, um, we feel that authorities actually are really well positioned um, to devise and implement implement meaningful participatory approaches um, through co-design and co-production. Um, in particular, they benefit from having a depth of local knowledge and relationships which can be drawn from, um, and uh, as opposed to potentially hiring in external consultants that may be outside of their locality and network and often don't leave a legacy of that knowledge behind. Um, so many, much of this we've seen has been really clearly demonstrated with the local authorities' response to COVID. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so when it comes to actually sharing power, governance is key, and this can sometimes be messy, complicated, and resource heavy. So, and often with managing relationships and organizational tensions being the, one of the biggest challenges when moving to a co-production delivery model. Um, however, um, we found that strong internal, um, if, if you can facilitate strong internal networks across departments, so breaking up silos and that kind of thing, as well as the external relationships with stakeholders and communities, this can mitigate some of the constraints that authorities face. Um, and it's apparent um, that there, there is still work that needs to be done in terms of tools and increased capacity, capacity um, in order to prompt local authorities to collaborate more and build the key relationships, both internal and external, that will help them fundamentally move towards a more participatory model. And I guess to some extent that was my role within local authority. Um, so to kind of shift gears a little bit, uh, moving to Malawi, a more kind of international context. Um, and I just wanted to bring this up. This is a, um, a project uh, which is um, uh, partnered with um, a social enterprise called Beyond Water Malawi. And it's something that's driven through the design studio that I'm a director of, um, Insider Outsider. So first of all, just to introduce Insider Outsider, we're an emerging non-profit design studio that focus on working with marginalized people and communities. And essentially every project that we do, we put those people at the heart of the design process um, through all different kinds of things, co-design, co-production, human-centered design, capacity building. Um, so this project uh, is called Scaling Rural Access to Water in Malawi, and it's focusing particularly on women um, who, in spite of being the primary stakeholders responsible for the collection of potable water, are often excluded from household decision making in regards to water infrastructure and household spending. Um, so uh, essentially, in light of COVID-19, our role in this project shifted. And in a way, I think it's been an element of um, something really positive that's come out of COVID. So rather than us being um, as we were kind of originally thought we were going to be, which would be to lead on human centered design and co-design for the project, um, we've actually ended up um, basically training um, local Malawians and the Beyond Water staff who are all Malawian and based there um, in human centered design and co-design. Um, which has essentially allowed them to di directly deliver and facilitate human centered design to refine and develop um, the design strategies um, for um, new um, water pumps and services, um, as well as like an ecosystem of mechanics that maintain these water pumps. Um, and that training and facilitation and in a way like direct co-design and uh, of um, the delivery of this work actually really takes us one, one step closer to thinking about how we can also decolonize design. 
so kind of going back to what Olivia was speaking about this morning, I think it's really interesting on um, actually how as designers we actually start to think about how do we give the people that we're working with, the communities that we're working with, the tools and, and the resources to enable them um, to um, essentially be empowered moving forwards. So once the designer, like the expert designer leaves, what's left behind and are they able to carry on that process? And that's something that we are moving towards with this project. Um, next slide, please, Kat. So in terms to just conclude um, what we've been talking about. So I think um, imagination and creativity is key. So sometimes co-design can be disappointing um, in that um, it may not be that it's always the most imaginative or playful um, answer. And um, this is where the role of the designer is really important as a facilitator, because we can actually pr um, provide and provoke permissions and create um, things that maybe the people that we're working with may not have always thought of. Um, but this really depends. It's, you know, every community is different. And sometimes you have got like an um, amazing nucleus of uh, super creative and proactive people that might be using design, but not necessarily knowingly. Um, in which case we can just like let them give them a bit more free reign. Um, but there's other instances where it might not always be um, uh, as aspirational as the, the experts want it to be. So, for example, the Design Council project that Kat mentioned, Homes 2030, this was kind of very um, much in this ill cold. Describe it a little bit again in a second. So, in terms of um, sharing power, um, co production essentially um it, it it requires a totally different relationship to power than what we've been used to and none of our kind of institutional structures and systems are really set up in that way we still very much as much as we we like to think we're moving towards a more networked approach a lot of organizations are still top-down hierarchies um so in a way we need to use design as a way to retrofit retrofit some of those systems and organizational structures um and Kind of to some extent resist the system uh, and in, ter in terms of the the project that we'll be talking about in the breakout space um, which is a community design network that we're working on at the moment with the design council um, we will be um, thinking about um, essentially those new governance structures that co-production requires so that's like you know it can be setting up steering groups for more equal um, power to the various institutional stakeholders involved um, but essentially a, in my experience there's often been a resistance to this and it, within the local government context um, local governments have retreated to co-design rather than sticking with co-production because they've not been able to overcome governance issues um, and this is what the work is really about, is trying to change that mindset and making these processes more commonplace and easier for that to be um, something that is possible for a local government context to support. So in terms of communications and expectations, this is another really important factor. So again, I think that most of us are probably all aware of this, but clarity on the opportunities for involvement for the people that we're involving real clarity on the scope of influence that the stakeholders are actually going to have over that outcome. So it's really horrible when um, and really disappointing when uh, a community or a group of individuals think they will, they're actually going to genuinely get to shape something. And in reality, it ends up just being a lip surface um, kind of political exercise um, to setting the parameters for co-production and integrating real time feedback systems um, as well. So that kind of continual communication process is maintained and you don't get things like consultation or engagement fatigue within communities. Um, so then in terms of co-production um, and co-design um, as a process in, in its own right, um, we're also key to kind of keen to uh, um, to highlight how um, the process in its own right is something that is of immediate benefit to those involved. That can be from everything from developing and gaining new skills to the health and well-being benefits of being involved in a community, as well as the cohesion and, enhan and enhanced unity and public ownership of a place that comes through being involved in shaping it. Um, so, and then in terms of 
uh, the um, diffuse and experts designers. So we're all designers and we do have technical skills and it's important to know um, when and how we need to be involved and at different stages when it's important for technical experts to be involved and when it's important to give space to communities or non-traditional designers um, to have that space to be the experts of their own experience. Um, so in the Homes 2030 project, I think it was in order to push and enhance the spec of the design, particularly in relation to the climate emergency, um, the, it was important to involve leading professionals in that process while the ord ordinary people push the overall design principles of the home. Um, and then finally, to creating the infrastructure for co-production, which is essentially linked to all of the above points, but creating the technical um, po and policy skills to create the conditions for more co-produced outcomes. Um, so next slide, please. Just so to say, you've got uh, one minute left, if that's okay. That's all good, okay. So in terms of the community design network that we're working on, um, we are focusing this very much in between in that in that space in between what we might call invisible designers or invisible activists to the expert designers and we're currently exploring um, a network that can support peer to peer exchange mentorship um, improving personal relationships direct learning and storytelling um, to supporting communities and activists in navigating the bureaucracy and being able to speak that local government or institutional professional language. This might potentially be even manifested through the communities um, training the local authorities is something that we're exploring. Um, and then in terms of the network itself, just to mention some of the key insights that, that have emerged through the co-design process that we've had with the groups that we've been working with so far, which are a spread across the country, inclusive of all walks of life. Um, we have, um, identified there's a struggle to scale organizations and impact so particularly things that are starting at the grassroots that struggle to scale once they grow into charities and the different kinds of demands that has on the, the, the pressures for uh, to scale labor and funding and so forth um, then the importance of maintaining autonomy independence and ownership so there's almost like a need for a no strings attached flexible community focused funding um, that will be allow, allow different groups to meet their operational needs. Um, to protecting the commons and community assets. So many groups are basically working with underused assets within their communities and bringing them into life um, by, proving and show, um, by proving demand and showing need. Um, and then there's also the, the um, a lot of the groups have emerged through responding to urgent need and institutional inertia. So it's almost like a, a bit like very common um, uh, kind of response has been, we did this just because we had to do it. And it's like a, almost like a just do it DIY approach, which is very common throughout all of the groups that we've been working with. Um, and then I think again, to kind of reflect on some of the difficult, some of the challenges, which are to do with the, the conflicting perceptions of value, conflicting perceptions of what communities are, what they do, the political risks and so forth. And finally, a kind of number one, one which I'm sure we're all familiar with, which is funding and financial resilience. So ongo ongoing challenges to access funding, um, lack of trust um, from institutions to, um, in communities to actually deliver their own projects. So essentially, these are the kinds of things that we are hoping this design network will be able to address. And we really look forward to sharing uh, the further development and um, getting to talk to you a little bit more about it in the breakout groups. Great, thank Kat, you. I don't know if you have much. any last comments, Kat. That's it, perfect. Thank you. Thank you very much um, for a fascinating presentation. I'm just, I've got so many other questions um, from seeing your slides of the, the projects that you've been working on on ageing, on debt, um, and, and all of them uh, placing people, the people, at the heart of the process. Um, I guess um, we are at the point where we should ask some um, questions. So I'm just going to have a look into the chat. We've got a question here from Matthew. Um, we always notice nearly everyone in the pictures of collaborative design has grey hair. How do we better engage young people? Yeah, apologies for that. that. It's something that always comes up when we're showing our slides in lectures. 
Um, do you want me to answer that? <laughs> yeah, go for it. Fantastic. Yeah. I don't know if you've got some uh, examples too. Um, well, I think first and foremost, it's um, that there's we need to invest in uh, work with young people. And there are lots of examples where young people have, where they've been given the opportunity, they have been super involved in projects. So, for example, Build Up springs to mind. They're a social enterprise that build um, different interventions uh, with young people within, particularly surrounding new developments. Um, but everything from, I mean, we actually have been um, working with the Norwest Media Centre whose um, building was designed by young people and it's the biggest straw bale building in the UK. But in terms of actually getting young people involved, I think it's um, essentially we, we have to invest in that. We have to invest time and energy into creating programmes that are relevant for young people and meaningful for them and also communicated in the kinds of platforms that they want to be involved in shaping this work. Um, so I've, I mean, I've been doing a lot of work within universities as well. So looking at decolonizing the built environment and um, essentially a lot of that is, I think about giving young people that sense of ownership over the, the places that they live and knowing that they are welcome in the conversation. I think that's a key thing, isn't it? To make sure that people know that they are listened to and that they have a voice and giving them the tools to, to communicate in, in their way. Um, mm. Thank you. That was a good question. And there's a, a, another couple of questions here that we've got time for. Um, how do you ensure that you engage with your hard to reach? How accessible is your engage? How accessible is your engagement, i.e. people without basic skills? Any of you, have you got any thoughts on, on this question? How do you ensure you engage with the hard to reach? I think a lot of the work that both myself um, outside of the design council and within the, the design council have been doing and also the design council more broadly has been doing is essentially it's often founded on principles of inclusive design. So um, often we will have panels that might include um, people that come are part of that kind of category of hard to reach. Um, and essentially that is providing um, a design space that, that works for them and that is appropriate for them. In, in my personal experience, it's providing a variety of options. So often you'll see in like, particularly in community engagement programs, there might be only one way to be involved. And um, I would always try and disrupt and shift that and have a variety of different ways to be involved but I think again putting specific resources into um, and making sure that those voices are able to come forwards and supporting them in that process and I think another side of co-production which is maybe we'll, we'll discuss this more um, which is uh, a debatable um, topic but actually um, if depending on what the project is, but if it's a large scale development project and you want your, your community and those hard to reach voices, voices involved, particularly it might be people who are carers or who have low incomes, then they need to be paid um, for, their, for their work. And that um, I think is really interesting and important in terms of like these power dynamics that we talked about. So creating a non-hierarchical space where experts and um, non-traditional designers are equals. So for example, in some projects that I've been involved in, um, it just is that everyone's paid the same, the same living wage and there's an equality across the spectrum. So if you've got a mixture of experts, designers and non-traditional designers working together, then there's a sense of equality um, amongst them. And also just kind of, again, to um, make it something that is available and possible for people who are not just the affluent, not just the, the voices that are always um, the ones that, that have the time and the, the means to, to get involved in this kind of work. And I'd, I'd love to hear a bit about um, TASFIC and, and peer research, but I might just say that... Um, I was just thinking of that. <laughs> yeah, but one of the things that, um, I mean, on just the question about like where, like, go to where they are so um, this is a different example but it was working with young people in Birmingham about STDs um, and so we knew young people hung out in the cinema so we went and hung out in the cinema 
and we engaged them and did F free hands out free. We gave away free cinema ticket or free popcorn at the cinema if you had an STD test um, in the in the toilet when you were there. So I mean that's an, an extreme example, but like going to where people are and then you know peer research. So actually upskilling people to um, do peer research with their with their with their kind of neighbours with their friends. Which Tasha, do you want to? Just give some of your examples from that. Yeah, I was um, just the point about uh, working with young people. Um, of course, there are loads of examples, both that we've worked on, but other people have done. I think we just didn't highlight those here, but also uh, some from my previous projects working with young people at the Young Foundation. Um, there's something about uh, having projects that are longer term. Uh, and giving space and time for young people to engage in those projects rather than a shorter term thing. Um, and then for how to engage with professional designers who step in and now, I think at the Design Council, we're also challenging what professional designers are and what community designers are, what that really means uh, throughout this community design network as well. And the peer-to-peer -peer research network is um, community outreach people, community practitioners, uh, developing research skills, developing digital skills to do online engagement, online research, and really being able to work with people that actually professional, so-called professional designers may not be able to access or work with. And in that process, people are also be developing skills, how to, how to do their interviews online and getting that training and potentially also becoming uh, peer researchers in their in their networks. Okay, thank you very much.